Hey, welcome back. Good evening. I'm Ruben. This is Bungie. You are looking at, you are watching, Studio 118, brought to you by Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come, let us reason, says the Lord, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to break down tough theological topics, apologetic topics for you guys so that you can have some fruitful conversations with those around you. Uh, so welcome back to another episode. We got a good one for you, talking about the reliability of the New Testament. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, I want to just mention that uh, we are streaming live on YouTube. That is most likely where you're watching us. Uh, there on YouTube.com slash Calvary South Austin. Uh, we have a live chat going. And of course, uh, as you may know, we have a QA and a uh, portion after our discussion. So if you have any questions about our discussion tonight, feel free to drop those questions in the live chat. Also, you might be watching us on Austin Cable Access Channel 11. And if so, welcome all one of you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you have a question that you'd like to um, pose to us, you can always call in your question at 512-576-5433. That's 512-576-5433. Or you can also email your questions to outreach at calvarysouthaustin.com. Uh, speaking of, we are here at Calvary South Austin. We've got a nice little studio audience. Welcome, guys. And uh, just to let you know, we are meeting um, we have opened the doors to our church. We are meeting in person uh, on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. and also on Sunday mornings uh, at 9.15 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. And we do have live streams available for those who uh, are still uh, sheltering in place. But just to let you know, we've taken all the necessary uh, safety measures here at the church to make sure we can have a safe time as we're worshiping the Lord together. Uh, <clears throat> if you have any questions about that, feel free to call our church. Again, that number is 512-576-5433, or you can um, email any questions you have at info at calvarysouthaustin.com. So I look forward to seeing you guys here. look forward to um, meeting you all, but uh, we have a good uh, discussion coming up uh, here before us, Bungie. We're talking about the reliability of the New Testament. So yes. this is... Um, there's a whole lot of other things we could be talking about right now. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> it's been a big day, huh? Yeah, it's been a... Long week, long two days, or I don't know how many days. What day is it? Thursday. Yeah, it is Thursday. I don't know what day, man. The day after Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, anyways, we're talking about reliability of New Testament. So this is something that uh, it actually kind of crept up last time we spoke, mm -hmm. and it, you know, our last discussion was almost half and half reliability. It started turning into that, but uh, in either case, we figured we continue the discussion and just give it the the depth that uh, that it deserves. So. Uh, but first, we want to talk about, okay, what is reliability when we talk about reliability of the New Testament? Um, and then also, uh, you know, for specifically for the Christian, you know, is this something that is supposed to be super important for the Christian to understand and, and really talk about? And then also for the skeptic, how does that help the skeptic maybe inch closer to becoming a believer, perhaps? Yeah, there's a lot to tackle in there, and uh, reliability, right? So when we're talking about something that's reliable, uh, we want to know, is this a reliable source of information uh, regarding what it's attempting to communicate to us? So uh, the, the main point of the Bible is salvation uh, in Jesus Christ. You know, of course, you know, we find the fall of man in Genesis, and, you know, we find uh, the inability of the Jews to keep the law, and, and uh, therefore the, the need for a Savior, and... Uh, this unfolding story of how God sent his only begotten son to come and offer himself as a sinless sacrifice uh, so that uh, sinners could be forgiven. And, you know, is this true? You know, can we rely on this story? Is there a reason for us to think that this is reality, that, that it communicates truthful things to us, that what it says in the pages of Scripture corresponds to the way things actually are in the world? Is Jesus the only savior, as the Bible uh, suggests and, and actually uh, insists. Because there's also competing stories as well. Oh, certainly. Way, right? Yeah, there's like a spaghetti monster out there, a flying spaghetti monster that allegedly wants to save us. TBD and, uh, on that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there, there are uh, other religious systems mm -hmm. with other beliefs. You know, recently we saw, you know, someone in the house praying to not only the God of the Bible, but also Brahma, mm -hmm. uh, as well as, you know, 
he, he didn't present a lot of names, but you know the gods that uh, you know are believed in yeah. in, in many other uh, faiths and basically and then, giving and equal footing to equal footing to all these different religions, and then closed the prayer with a amen and a women. Yes, uh, so <laughs> singular woman. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> uh, but uh, if the scriptures are true, if the if the Bible presents us with what is real, if, if, if the Bible is true, then it excludes all the other faiths. Mm-hmm. I remember going to a Baha'i, uh, it was kind of a informal debate. It really wasn't a debate. It was basically the Baha'i movement at the University of Texas uh, hosted a panel discussion amongst all these different faith systems uh, because Baha'i uh, basically attempts to uh, argue that uh, uh, that they're they're kind of like the end of the line. You have you know Muhammad, you have Jesus, you have uh, you know Moses, you have Abraham. You know, and 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 basically Baha'i comes along and says that yeah, we're just the the end of the line of all these uh, movements of God, right? So that they're basically suggesting that all these different faiths are basically the same progressing uh, uh, revelation from God, right? And, uh, and, and then there was a Q&A time at the end, and I got up uh, on the microphone, and, I, and, and my, I posed the question to the Christian who was up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it just kind of looked like this Christian was allowing the Christian faith to be kind of you know, blended in down. with all the other faiths. And so I, I asked the, 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 the Christian teacher that was on the panel uh, what Jesus meant uh, when he you know, essentially said that if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Yeah. And I, I, can you explain this if there are many ways? Yeah, yeah. Because Jesus is making an exclusive claim that he's the mm-hmm. only way, the only truth, the only life, that no man comes to the Father but by him. If that's true, then we have to rule out all the other faiths. Yep. And that's a huge claim, and, that, and that's very offensive uh, to a lot of people, understandably. Because if there's no way to justify that, if there's no way to support the belief that Jesus is the way of salvation, then uh, we're un, uh, in, in a very unreasonable, unkind way telling, telling all the other people of all the other faiths that their, their religious system is wrong. So we need you know, some good evidence to come along and say that, oh, no, no, your, your, your system of faith is wrong. Your religious system can't help you if you want salvation. You have to trust mm-hmm in the Jesus that we find in the scriptures. Yeah. All right. So can we rely on the information that we've received in the Bible? Yeah. Is it reliable information so that we can then turn around and tell someone from another faith that I'm sorry, but your faith is insufficient because it's not grounded in reality. Right. So when it comes to uh, this issue of the reliability of the scriptures, especially the New Testament, where we find the the, the full revelation mm-hmm. of our salvation in Jesus Christ, uh, we want to know, you know, is this reliable information, and and uh, and, and what is the, the the basis for that reliability? What is the proof mm-hmm. uh, that we can turn to the scriptures and say what it says is real and it corresponds to reality? Yeah, uh, and 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 of course, this is going to be one of the first arguments that people make against the Christian faith. I've been sharing my faith since 96. You know, I I came to faith at the end of 95. By 96, I was well on my way to to sharing my faith with other people. And one of the most common, consistent arguments against the Christian faith stems from some form of, can I really believe the Bible and what it says? Yep. Uh, so there is the, uh, the the argument that is basically uh, well, you know, the Bible was cooked up around a campfire. It was passed word of mouth like the game of telephone for many many years mm-hmm. until it was finally recorded. You know, several centuries later. So you can't really rely on it for you know accurate information because it wasn't written by eyewitnesses. That's basically one form of the argument. Yeah. Uh, another form of the argument is well, men are are, are fallible. Uh, and, and and therefore we, we, sh- we can't expect that any writing of any man is going to present us with accurate truth about God and, and whatnot. And so there's that form of the argument. Another one is that, well, the Bible's been changed so many times that you can't really believe that what it says today is the same as what was originally written, you know, whenever it was written. Yeah. And, and so how can you know? And, and of course, these are all arguments that we're going to dig more mm-hmm. into as we make our way through this conversation. 
but uh, inevitably, uh, most uh, uh, most Christian right. evangelists are going to come up against these arguments at some point in time. Yeah, you know, I've also heard, uh, this is another popular one, where just by the mere fact that it's a couple thousand years old, right. a document that is very old is less reliable than, I guess, more recent documents. Yes. You know? So there's another one that I, I see a lot of people clinging to, and they just kind of throw it out there thinking that it's a, it's a showstopper, right? Right. Now... So that yeah, that's good. Talking about what are we looking for in reliability? What uh, what is is essentially going to bring us over that hump to finally determine? Hey, can I can I really put my trust in this versus all the other belief systems? And that's uh, it's important, right? Because especially for Christians, as you were mentioning, this uh, Christian fellow at this discussion that you went to years ago, who probably could not. Um, give a good answer and there's plenty of other christians that do the same and for some reason or another right but it looks like at least recent polls so for instance i'm looking at a 2017 gallup poll that revealed and this is just speaking purely about americans right but 26 percent, so just a little bit over one quarter of americans believe the bible to be merely fables yeah. history and moral precepts recorded by man and so this 26 percent number is actually up from 21 percent just six years ago. Right. So that's a steady increase over the years, and maybe it's plateaued, or maybe it's continuing to increase, just seeing that secularization of culture, right? That's that's a large amount. So just in America, we have a quarter of the people believing that it's just, the Bible is really just a bunch of fairy tales, fables, and and just uh, maybe some history mixed in with a lot of legend. Right. Right? But yeah, these people, are they misinformed? Are they ignorant of a lot of the evidence? And that's what we're going to dig uh, a lot into, some of the objections that you brought up, right? And in my experience, uh, I think that that's a, a low number. You, you know, polls are always dependent sure. on, you know, who, who you're talking set. to, right? Right, right, right. So uh, in my experience going out on the streets, going down to the UT campus, and, and, and in that world, I think that number is a, a much, har- much higher, right? Mm-hmm. Because on average, when I share my faith in Jesus with an unbeliever at the University of Texas, the majority of those people that I come across are going to go straight to uh, the, the issues that they have with the Bible, it being changed or it being you know, written by men or whatever their, their argument is. Uh, that's typically one of the go-to arguments that, that I come across uh, out on the streets. Even with professing Christians, I've definitely encountered that where there might be a tough moral precept found in the Bible and they tend to want to buck against it and disagree right. it, disagree with it. And usually their justification is, well, the Bible was written for a certain time, right. or that kind of stuff, right? And they, they tend to basically uh, disagree with it and say, well, it's not really the word of God. It's not really meant for our culture today. And it's an old document, so right. we got to update it, right? Which, I mean, in, in some ways, it's a valid argument, right? Uh, so when God called the Israelites to go and wipe out the Canaanites, you know, that's mm-hmm. not something I should apply to my life today, right? The so, Canaanites of your life. <laughs> the, the Canaanites of my heart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, there are certain, you know, you have to understand how to properly interpret the scriptures and rightly divide the word of God mm-hmm. because... You know, there are certain things that no longer apply. So, so for example, uh, the Sabbath law, you know, doesn't apply to the church age. Mm-hmm. Uh, in one sense, you know, the Sabbath law is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. And so, so the Sabbath ultimately is fulfilled in the church age, but not in the sense of, you know, uh, sleeping all day Saturday, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, pork law, you know, the, you know the, the prohibition of eating seafood and, and, and pork. Uh, you know, which was something that was given uh, as a, you know, Levitical law. Mm -hmm. Uh, That no longer applies, you know, in the church age. You know, for those who trust in Jesus Christ, we can eat Diablo shrimp all day long uh, (laughs) and and just uh, enjoy it. Uh, So, you know, so so there are things, Mm -hmm. you know, that we see in the Bible that no longer uh, directly apply to Christians in the church age. Uh, You know, but as far as those things that still do apply, those things laid out in the epistles of the New Testament... Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, there, it's all applicable. It's all still true, regardless of whether you like it or not. Yeah. When 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 we see in the New Testament uh, a certain action uh, being uh, labeled as sinful or wicked, uh, 
you might not like that. You might wish that wasn't on the list of what is evil and sinful. But if it's labeled that way in the New Testament epistles, then it's true, regardless yeah. of whether you like it or not. Uh, but, the, but, the, but then you have liberal Christians who come along and they start picking and choosing what they like out of the New Testament. And, you know, they start making decisions of, well, I don't like these things, but I love those things. I, I love the love of Jesus. I don't <laughs> like the Jesus coming back and punishing everybody at like the end the of time. Rule. Right. Yeah. But his other speech about hell and uh, judgment. Which then this only goes to show that many Christians, and, and, I, and I wish I had a poll on this. I, I searched for a poll. Uh, I, I, right there, well, besides, no, oh, my yeah. I was looking for, you know, some sort of survey that could help me to understand, like, within the church. Yeah. Uh, within the church, how many Christians have a high view of the, of the Bible versus how many have a low view? Mm -hmm. how, how many Christians in the church uh, actually believe in what we call inerrancy and infallibility? Yeah. Uh, because it, I, if I had to guess, my guess is that uh, uh, e even church-based uh, uh, or ch church goers, I, I should say, sure. that there are many church goers today uh, who would just throw those ideas out and say, oh, no, the, the Bible's not inerrant or infallible. Yeah. So big word alert. Two big words. Right. But the, the point sure. being that, you know, they, can, they feel like they can come along and begin editing the New Testament for their own liking. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because they don't believe in inerrancy, nor do they believe in infallibility. Yeah. So, big, uh, big, yeah. big, big nerd alert, is that yes. what you said? <laughs> big nerd, big word. <laughs> uh, we got all the jokes, people. So... Yeah, talking about infallibility in versus inerrancy. So this is a big topic, and I've definitely see you know people will go the rounds on different forums online and whatnot. And this is this is um, an important discussion to have. So inerrancy. Let's let's break these down just so we understand we're all on the same page, right? So inerrancy, talking about specifically that the words found in Scripture uh, do not affirm any error. So, for instance, and this is, I think this is where a lot of people get tripped up in the sense that, well, don't pe aren't there lies in the Bible or aren't there, mm -hmm. um, you know, immoral things in the Bible that we shouldn't do, but, you know, certain characters in the Bible did right. them and that kind of stuff. And just because it's found in the Bible, therefore, it, it, you know, it gives us license to do it or something like that. Well, there's a, there's a, a misunderstanding here about whether the Bible is actually affirming errors throughout history or through people's lives and that's not so so just because something is found within the scriptures is not just a, a quick go ahead to say oh it's affirming that or it, this is an error and it, just because it's in the bible it's affirming it but we have to make a distinction between um something that the bible simply relates as a part of history something that just happened in history so for instance king david right who sinned a whole lot and he wrote a lot of good psalms so both of these things are found in Scripture, but our, understand, our complete understanding of Scripture should start with the understanding that this is God's Word, and so this actually ties into infallibility. But the point for inerrancy basically is that the Bible is not going to be uh, affirming any errors within it. Now, infallibility is taught, well, I guess I'll let, I'll let you split that one. Uh, as far as uh, In, infallibility, or gotcha. if you want to add anything to inerrancy. Well, yeah, I think uh, I think you've made a good point that uh, just because the Bible records something as true doesn't mean that what it records is true. All right. So, uh, you know, for example, the Bible records the, the day when Satan tempted Jesus to sin, twisted the scripture and offered him up a lie. Uh, it's true that Satan lied to Jesus. But that doesn't mean that the Bible is saying that it's good to lie to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, you know, inerrancy is that the scriptures don't affirm uh, anything that would be uh, an error or endorse anything that would be untrue. Uh, everything that the Bible endorses as a, a correct way of living uh, is all true. You know, you're not going to come to the scriptures and see, you know, where uh, God says murder is good. At the same time, we do find a God, you know, who uh, condemns sinners to death. But that's not murder, right? So, 
There's a whole lot, and we can do a whole show on inerrancy, right? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but then there's infallibility. Uh, infallibi infallibility means that the Word of God is incapable of containing errors. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that trips people up, too, you know, because we do, uh, we do see um, issues, uh, uh, minor variations, which we'll talk about yeah. later on in the show, uh, in our uh, translations, our modern translations, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and most of our modern translations come from one of two different families of manuscripts. Uh, and, and between those two families, we see uh, variations, uh, just minor ones, but, but they're there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so somebody could come along and say, oh, there's errors. You know, there's this number in this translation or, or in this uh, family manuscripts, and that, that number is different in this family of manuscripts, therefore there's errors. Uh, but listen, when we talk about the infallibility of the Bible, what we're talking about are the original autographs. Mm -hmm. You know, when when author put pen to papyrus, uh, <laughs> we're talking about that original autograph was free from error. Yeah. And now it's been copied and and you know created uh, you know and, and passed down uh, you know through uh, transmission and translation, which we'll talk more about in a little while. Yeah. Uh, and in that, we see you know scribal errors. We see you know copyist you know errors. Uh, and, but that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about infallibility. Yeah. What we're saying is that the, the Holy Spirit of God inspired uh, the holy men of God to uh, write down the perfect information uh, that is completely without error mm -hmm. uh, in its original form. Yeah. And so maybe perhaps for the audience, right, if, if you have um, not even a study Bible, but just any Bible that's worth its salt or even go online, find a, find a Bible online. And with footnotes specifically, what we're talking about here is you might notice uh, certain footnotes that mention on certain verses that say, well, this family of manuscripts words uh, this certain verse this way, or this certain phraseology found in this verse is omitted from this family of manuscripts. So uh, if you have a study Bible or just a Bible with footnotes, you might see some of those notes. And it's, if you've never read those footnotes, I mean, I encourage you to do so. You might learn a little bit more about your Bible. Um, so these are the kinds of things we're talking about. So infallibility, talking about the original autographs. And again, you know, why is this so important for the Christian, but also for the non-Christian here? Again, we're talking about reliability. When you have competing worldviews and competing documents, and we have to figure out, can I ultimately put my trust in what the documents are purporting to tell me? You know, the Bible is a collection of, of books written over across, you know, over 1,500 years, has over 40 different authors compiled into one book called the Bible, called the Word of God, and it's talking about history. It has poems in there. Uh, it has the life uh, and death and resurrection of Jesus. It has miracle claims. It talks about what's going to happen in the future. Can we ultimately put our trust in, in what the Bible is talking about? Is, is it true over and against, let's say, uh, the, the Quran or let's say uh, the Jehovah's Witness supposed translation of the Bible called the New World Translation or the Book of Mormon and their other uh, scriptures? Those are all making claims for themselves, but the Bible is, is standing alone. In fact, uh, it's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible actually... Uh, describes itself as the Word of God, and it gives us an indication as to what it should be used for. So, for instance, 2 Timothy 3.16 starts and says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Nice. So a couple of claims, right? All scripture is given by inspiration of God, literally meaning God breathed. And this is where we get our notion of inspiration, that this is, yes, men wrote the Bible, but it was God inspiring uh, for them to them what to write. Yeah. But then also, what is the Bible for? It's not just a collection of stories, but actually has a purpose to equip the person who is reading these, uh, the Bible for every good work that God has planned for them. I know you had another one on, on inspiration as well. Well, Peter, uh, referring to uh, his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he saw Jesus transfigured, uh, you know, he uh, began to uh, write in his second epistle about how that was a confirmation of the entire prophetic word of God. And he says, so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns 
and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know, they were kind of carried on with, with the wind, like a, like, a, a, like a sailboat that's being pushed forward by a strong wind. Uh, these holy men were moved by the Holy Spirit, inspired, as you put it, from uh, uh, you know, Second, uh, uh, Second Timothy 3, mm-hmm. inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen the very words uh, that they wrote. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on as well. Yeah. But uh, the, the prophecy of Scripture uh, is very confirming uh, when it comes to the, to the Bible. And, and uh, we might have time to, to get more into prophecies you know, later on. Yeah. But uh, to, sum it, to sum it up with simplicity, there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies about the Messiah found in the Old Testament. And, and we can prove that the Old Testament was written before the birth of Jesus Christ uh, just by using the Septuagint. Uh, so, so we know that the, the Old Testament was written and canonized and translated into Greek before the birth of Jesus Christ. We know that all those prophecies that pointed to the coming Messiah uh, were written before Jesus was born. And then Jesus comes along and uh, through his birth, life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension fulfills uh, the, the, all of the prophecies that point to the first advent, mm-hmm. uh, which when you look at the, uh, the, statistical, uh, the, the statistics on this and the compound law of probabilities and, and how probable is it for one man to fulfill all these prophecies, it, it, is, uh, it is a huge confirmation that the Old and the New Testament uh, have been inspired yes. by a mind, a being that sits outside of time and space. Right. And if anybody out there is interested in a little bit more on that, again, we might get into that a little bit later tonight. But our last discussion last month, talking about um, uh, Christmas and the the first advent of Jesus, we did go into prophecy, the prophecies of the first coming of Jesus. And we talked a little bit more about that. So you might want to check out that archived um, episode there on YouTube. So we've laid the groundwork as to, you know, what the state of the culture is today in regards to what people believe about the Bible. And then also, why is it important for us to figure out, you know, whether this, this collection of documents, as it were, ancient documents are, uh, are important to us? Why, why should we, you know, spend time figuring out whether it's reliable or not? So I think it's time now to kind of get into uh, this, this first conundrum that's always brought up. It's a, it, I, I, personally, I think it's probably the most popular one that I hear, at least. And I always hear it put, it this, put this way. <laughs> Well, the Bible has been translated over and over and over right. to so many languages. How do you even know what the original looked like? You know, it's been a couple thousand years and it's been translated so many times. How can I put my trust in a document like that, right? And, you know, I, I, I hear this question a lot. And, and when I hear it in the context of what they're talking about, they're not talking about translations. They're talking about transmission. That's the, that's the way I typically hear the context. You know, they, they don't understand, you know, how uh, it can go from the first century, you know, through all these copyist hands all the way down, or from the fourth century if they think it was, you know, written in the fourth century. And, you know, it's been transmitted to us over all this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you factor in also the translation issue of um, taking it from one leg- language to the next. And, uh, you know, a lot of people just have a hard time believing that you know, people can keep uh, the Bible free from um, uh, major errors, you know, so that uh, the, the Bible today is the same as what the original autographs uh, were when they were written. So yeah, very popular argument. Uh, so can we believe in both the transmission and the translation of the scriptures? Uh, so so with that, you know, you want to get in and talk a little bit about what do we mean by transmission versus translation? Yeah, and you know, just to add. <clears throat> We'll get there and just add a little bit more, right? I, a popular illustration is, a couple of popular illustrations, you brought one of them up is, you know, people think that the scriptures were talked about around a campfire. Stories. And, yeah, campfire stories. Yeah. And then from that point on, the people left and they started disseminating that information. And then those people talk to other people. And in, uh, this relates now to the other illustration is they, they consider it as the telephone game. Right, little kindergarten game where kids sit in a circle, teacher whispers a secret message into one of the kids' ears, the first kid, 
And then that kid, five or six years old, granted, is supposed to then relay that same message to the next person and then goes and so on and so forth, all the way around the circle. And of course, at the end of the circle, you're supposed to hear this garbled message that it sounds nothing like the original message. And that's the whole point of the game. It's supposed to be a fun game and see you know, how people hear things and uh, also how much they remember from the original message. And so people liken that illustration then to how the Bible was translated and transmitted throughout history. So the idea apparently is that the original authors didn't write anything down apparently, or maybe they did write something down, but they only showed it once. And then those people who saw or heard the, the message once then tried to relay that information to other people miles and miles away and then throughout history, you just have this message spreading. But from the, from the very inception of it, errors are already being introduced. And then these errors are so significant that it leads to things like miracles. It leads to things like Jesus being God or this idea of the Trinity. That's how those messages crept into the Bible over time. Because you just had people garbling this message up. And people said, yeah, that makes sense. I think we'll put it in the Bible. And then there's nefarious individuals like myself. Like, you know, anytime I was in a classroom where the, where the telephone game was <laughs> being played, guy, yeah. I'm that guy. I'm the guy that's going to just just make up my own thing and pass that down the line. I'm not even going to try to remember what you know, I don't even care. It's like I, what I want to happen is a whole different thing end up, you know, at the end of the line. And that, that's fun for me. So, uh, yeah, that, that so were there people like that, you know, yeah. who uh, came along and they, they heard some nice stories about Jesus, how he was a good teacher, you know, and then they heard the story and decided, well, let's, let's you know, jazz this up a bit. Yeah. You know, he rose from the dead. Yeah, that's what we'll say. Or they have an agenda right. and they want power. Yeah. yeah. That's usually the way I see it put it is history is written by the winners. Yeah. You know, so to speak. And so this is the classic illustration that a lot of even well-minded Christians or well-meaning Christians rather, but also skeptics, this is the way they view the transmission and translation of the Bible. But uh, going to your question, right? What is the difference when we talk about translation versus transmission? Well, translation, I think when we say the word, obviously we We've usually used it in the context of translating from one language to another. And that's literally what we're talking about. So if you don't know, the original um, language being uh, spoken in the Bible was not written in English. You know, no, no offense. Well, a little bit of offense to the King James only people. <laughs> but the original language of the Bible was uh, Old Testament uh, Hebrew and some Aramaic. And then in the New Testament, you have... Uh, Koine Greek, and also a little bit of Aramaic thrown in there. And that was the original language. And then over some of the centuries, of course, because you're, this message is spreading to different lands with different uh, languages being spoken, there was a need for translation, going from one language to another. That is the uh, picture of translation. Now, granted, and we'll talk about this, there, we're, we're owning up to this, of course, when you translate something, there's there's going to be a loss of information by definition. But you have to ask yourself, well, how much information is being lost? And we'll, we'll get into that in, uh, in a little while. But that's translation. When it comes to transmission, I think the, the world probably knows a lot about transmission now, <laughs> given COVID. We know transmission is actually stuff being promulgated. It's being spread and, and how it's spread. You know, what is the nature of that, of that spreading? So, when one document, this, let's say we have the original autograph, you know, Paul just finished writing one of his, his uh, prison letters, sends it off with a messenger. It's read in a church. They have it for a little while, and they said, you know what, we want to spread this message um, to a different number of churches. Well, let's copy it down the same, in the same language and um, the, the same words, obviously, and we want to spread that message to multiple sites. That's being transmitted now to various places. So it's the same language, but now it's going to different locations. So hopefully you can see the distinction between translating, going from one language to another, and transmission, just how it spreads. But again, what we were bringing up is the confusion I think a lot of people, when they bring up this, uh, this claim, is that they say it's been translated over and over and over, but I think mistakenly they, they actually mean 
it's been passed down through so many hands. Yeah, that so there's got to be some mistakes. So typically, you know, uh, they're usually raising the uh, campfire mm -hmm. telephone game story, uh, which is uh, more of a transmission issue than a translation. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and then a lot of times, you know, it, it is that uh, well, how do we know that you know people didn't manipulate it along the way? Less concerned about the translation, you know, because while translation does have uh, you know some issues with loss of information, just you know, like uh, when, when you read the Bible in the English language, you see the word love, uh, and, yes. <laughs> and and if you don't know better, you don't realize that there's actually four different words that could be used yeah. that uh, provide a little bit more information about mm -hmm. what kind of love we're talking about. You know, you have your eros and, and you've got your, you Milo. know, Philo, you got your Storge and you've got your Agape, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so these are all four distinctly different kinds of love. And you would never know that uh, by just looking uh, at the English translation, right? right? But it's not that, you know, it, this alters, you know, the information in any huge way. Right. Uh, but, it, 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 you know, if you look at the Greek, and then you get a little bit more detail about what kind of love we're talking about, and that's, that's cool. Mm -hmm. But that's a translation issue, yeah. you know, versus the transmission issue, which could actually affect, uh, say, like a person's testimony, right? If, mm -hmm. if you have a written testimony uh, of, an, of an eyewitness... Uh, and he hands or she hands that written testimony off uh, to, you know, let's say they, they create an affidavit. You know, let's just say like they saw like, uh, I don't know, um, let me just grab a, a, a random idea here, maybe voter fraud you or, <laughs> you know, maybe they saw, you know, some sort of, you know, nefarious activity nice. happening at, say, like a polling location. And so they, they go and uh, allegedly <laughs> <laughs> and they go and they and they create, you know, an affidavit. Right. And, and sign off on it. If that gets passed to someone who's up to no good mm -hmm. and wants to go in and manipulate the information and change it. Right, uh, so that you know this affidavit no longer mm -hmm. makes the allegation that that they were initially making. Right, uh, you, you know, so so if it if it if it, if it falls out of the proper hands and into the hands of someone that can't be trusted, then the written affidavit no longer can be trusted in a court of law. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's why you know one one of the rules in uh, uh, you know engaging in uh, historical forensics uh, of antique writings is that the writing itself has to have been kept within the proper repository, mm -hmm. you know, so that it bears, yeah, so that it bears upon itself, no evident marks of forgery yeah. for it to be considered, you know, valid as a, a piece of eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. Right. So when it comes to transmission, you know, if the Bible were to fall out of the hands of Christians and Christians don't have the Bible for a season, but let's say, you know, uh, the Muslims got a hold of it mm -hmm. and, and they decided that they're going to monkey with it a little bit and change the stories or it got into the hands of, you know, some nefarious character like King James, you know, and he decided that he's, you know, going to make the Bible say what he wants it to say. And, yeah. you know, and that's that's one of the most common arguments is, well, King James, when he got a hold of the Bible, he changed everything. Right. And also Constantine. Uh, yeah, you got to love Constantine. Yeah. Gotta love <laughs> uh, are we talking about the movie? But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but, but with the King James issue, you know, that's one of the, one of the go-to arguments that you could typically hear is that, well, when King James got a hold of it, he mm -hmm. changed a bunch of stuff, and now we don't even know what was initially said. Well, that's interesting, right? Because what they don't realize is that we actually have manuscripts from other languages that weren't affected by the King James Version of the Bible, mm -hmm. that if you translate those manuscripts from those other languages like Syriac and, and Aramaic and these sorts of things, uh, we've got Latin version, and, mm -hmm. and if you translate uh, you know, those uh, foreign language Bibles uh, into English, uh, it basically says the same thing as the King James version of the Bible, showing mm -hmm. that you know it, that, that King James didn't alter the text. He didn't. He wasn't able to go and destroy all the Bibles in the world except for his translation of the Bible. Yeah. Uh, so, but but this is all dealing with transmission, yeah. right? Uh, and and th this is the, the great concern that I think a lot of uh, unbelievers have uh, and why they struggle to believe in the reliability of the Bible is, is because they think that it's been altered and changed over the years since, you know, whenever the autographs were written, which they typically think, yeah. you know, third, fourth century, uh, you know, uh, and, and so, so therefore they've got a, a transmission issue in word of mouth until these stories are 
altered, changed, turned into, into fantasy and fable, then written down, mm -hmm. you know, third, fourth century, and then passed down uh, without any care for for transmission. Though there's accurate translation, they're concerned that the translation was affected in the transmission. Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up skeptics that bring up these objections, right? But it's it's not even just non-religious people. It's religious folks. I'm sure. thinking like Jehovah's Witnesses who um, famously claim that right after the disciples died, the original 12, that from that point on, the word of God was disrupted. It was perverted you know, beyond all belief, and it wasn't until Charles Taze Russell came along somehow and... Saved the day. Saved the day, right? <laughs> Same thing with Mormonism. Yeah. There is a perfection that, I, don't, I forget what the word they use, that, that basically they, there needed to be a cleaning up of what was distorted. So th they certainly believe in progressive revelation. That, but there's a... But, but yeah. Uh, I forget the term. Yeah. Uh, either case, also Muslims uh, make a big... Uh, deal about the way that uh, Christians after the disciples again just perverted the word in the transmission right. as well as the translation right. until the final prophet Muhammad came along and uh, was actually revealed directly the word of Allah, right? So it's religious and non-religious alike. Yes. So again, this just uh, really, em we're really emphasizing the importance of discovering the reliability of the New Testament uh, and even the Bible as a whole. Do we have good evidence? So I think uh, one of the big pieces of evidence we have are the actual manuscripts that we have. Right. And that's that's one of my go-to arguments is that when people start saying the Bible's been changed, I just ask them to, to show me the manuscripts. Right. Mm -hmm. Because if that is the argument that the Bible used to say something else, but now it, now it's been changed and altered and, and nefarious people came along and manipulated the stories for their own you know benefit. King James came along, changed everything. Uh, well, then uh, you should be able to, you know, that it's an argument from silence until you produce the manuscripts from which the modern versions have been changed. Right. So it, it's one thing to say the Bible has been changed. And I can't prove it with manuscript evidence. Well, that's an argument from silence. That's an assertion. Yeah. And that, that's usually what I get a little bit annoyed at is that you want to ask the question, well, okay, you're making the assertion, so show me. Prove it. Show me, show me the evidence. And you're, you're asking, show me the specific yep. manuscripts where, where you think that the Bible that I have in my hand is, where are the errors? Yeah. And what manuscripts do they come from? Yeah, and this gets back into a legal court case, right? That if somebody's going to come along in a, in a court of law and say uh, that, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a legal affidavit has been altered yeah. or an antique writing has been altered, uh, you, uh, the, the person that's making that claim, the, the burden of proof is on them to produce the evidence of the alteration. Right. So if someone comes along and says, oh, the Bible's been changed, uh, it, it's an antique writing uh, that has come down to us through the proper repository. But in that repository, you know, one group decided to change it along the way. Uh, then uh, in a court of law, the person making that claim would then be expected to produce the evidence mm -hmm. of an earlier work uh, the, from which, you know, the Bible has been changed. And we don't, the, the earlier the manuscript, the, the more it supports the modern Bibles that we have today. Yeah, and that's, that's a, a really good point, because I, I think that's something that a lot of people don't appreciate is what is the work of a historian? A, a historian who's dealing with ancient documents, what exactly are they looking for? And what do they prefer? Hmm. And again, this relates back to the objection of, well, the Bible is just 2,000 years old. There's no way we can trust a document so right. old, right? Well, that's not necessarily the case. Right. What, what a historian is looking for is the documents, how close are they to the events that they are writing about? Yes. It's not necessarily just how old it is. I mean, we have a bunch of ancient documents that a bunch of historians have come down and said, more than likely, this is reliable. This is telling truth. Like the Constitution? <laughs> yes, it's a living document. <laughs> oh. The older it gets, each year that yeah. passes by, <laughs> it's fading away like, like Marty McFly in Back to the Future. Wow. Yeah, throw that out. So a historian is 
ultimately hoping, man, I wish I had a manuscript that was very, very close. Or to a the wool events. manuscript? Yes, a wool manuscript. Sorry. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> An X script. Uh, it's just so easy. <laughs> that is how just close so it easy. Is to the actual events that it's writing about, right? This is what makes a historian drool. They, they, if they had something that, let's say, uh, uh, I mean, bring up recent events, right? So like moon landing, 9 11, that kind of stuff. And we have books already written, eyewitness testimony, interviews on, on TV, and that kind of stuff. So let's go into the future some couple of centuries. And after the apocalypse, of course, which is happening soon, <laughs> uh, let's say, you know, historians are digging up evidence and they're trying to say, well, I, I see people are writing about this event called the moon landing. Did, mm -hmm. did this actually happen? And they start digging up different eyewitness testimonies, books that were written and, and whatnot. And let's say they had uh, even JFK's speech even before talking about we're going to land on the moon, that kind of stuff. Historians would be, yes, as close as I can get to the event, I prefer that versus a document that was written 200 years later talking about maybe this happened or I'm basically writing a fairy tale at that point. I have no connection to the people in that generation, no connection to the place of origin even. You're more than likely to get a lot of those details wrong. So that's why they prefer documents that are as close to the event as right. possible, regardless of how old it is. And that's something I, I, I believe more people should appreciate about the work being done there. Yeah, I was born uh, the day before the moon landing. My dad was actually part of McDonnell Douglas, which was a, a, being contracted by NASA to, to help out with that whole space race program. I mean, you know, many, many Americans were part of the space race program. And, uh, you know, if, if I were to come along and say, uh, you know, the... The moon landing, you know, there were, there were three female astronauts that went up in, in an Argentinian spacecraft. And, and, you know, and I started, you know, changing the, the details of the story. Uh, many people in, in my age group uh, and older, uh, you know, would, would recognize that, no, the, the, these details have been changed and altered, right? Because it was just 50 years ago or so, mm -hmm. right? So the, the eyewitnesses who were alive and, and worked on this program and, and, and saw the, the, the news broadcast and, you know, and all these sorts of things, uh, you know, they, they witnessed to some degree uh, this event and would uh, tell you real quick if you have your facts wrong, uh, you know, about, you know, what kind of craft it was and how long the... the, 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 the the trip took and how long they stayed on the moon and what, mm -hmm. what was said when they stepped off uh, out of the ship and all these sorts of things, right? Well, now think about how this applies to uh, the first century. Mm -hmm. If Matthew comes along and starts writing in the first century stories about Jesus being a miracle worker, rising from the grave, ascending into heaven, right? If he's writing in the first century, well... The people who actually knew Jesus would know that he was making up fairy tales, mm -hmm. and they would be quick to correct him. You would find uh, books from the first century saying Matthew's a big fat liar. You know Jesus didn't do any of those things that he says Jesus did. Yeah. But we don't find those those contrary works. And and as you pointed out earlier, well, history is written by by the, the victors, victors, right? Well. The, the Christian church wasn't victorious, so to speak. They, they weren't accepted in the world until the time of Constantine, mm -hmm. right? So first century, second century, third century, they were not the victors. They were hiding. They were, uh, you know, they, they, the, the church was underground very, very quickly as soon as, you know, uh, Roman emperors started dipping them in tar and, and using them as, as candles in, yep. in, in, in the uh, arenas. Like the path, yeah. Right, so uh, you don't have Christians being victorious in the first, second, and third century, and yet you find these, the, you find manuscript evidence that takes us all the way back to at least the early second century, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which places, uh, if, if these are copies, then you have autographs that are more than likely uh, in the first century. And I would even take it further and show you uh, the interior argument from the, the book of Acts, Acts, uh, which is Luke's second work, mm -hmm. uh, it wraps up before the destruction of the temple. Mm -hmm. And Luke records various persecutions. He records a lot of huge details and minor details 
uh, but he does not record the destruction of the temple, which took place in 70 AD. Yeah. And the only reason for that, the only reason why a historian like Luke would fail to include the destruction of the temple there in Jerusalem is because he finished writing his book before 70 AD. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's his second book. Luke is his first book. And in the, in the Gospel of Luke, we see him interviewing all of the eyewitnesses and putting together an orderly account of all the things that he learned from those who were there to witness the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right. So if we can put the book of Acts before 70 AD, and we can, then we have to put the book of Luke earlier than that mm -hmm. and, and you know uh, i mean uh, scholars you know debate about you know what year but you know i'm, I'm guessing that luke was probably written uh, in in the 50s i mean that's 20 years after the the death of jesus christ yeah and if luke is writing about the 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 birth the miraculous birth of jesus the miraculous life of jesus the 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 rising from the grave the ascension into heaven if if luke is writing about these events 20 years after the life of jesus christ you don't have enough time to create fiction here because the eyewitnesses would come along and say no luke you got it all wrong and we ought to find those those materials mm -hmm. We have to find the materials of the skeptics in the first century who were opposing the gospel of Luke. But we don't find that. Yeah. We don't find that. And, and yet, uh, the, the Christians weren't running around, you know, burning down libraries in the first century. They weren't burning down libraries in the second century or third century. They were running for their lives. Yeah. So why is it that we, we find manuscripts of the New Testament that date back to the early second century, but we don't find manuscripts of skeptics and, and anti-Christians who were railing against these fantasy stories created by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, you know, something else to appreciate is the person might say, well, why couldn't, you know, if, if these gospels and these writings of Paul were so important, why couldn't they just hang on to the autographs? You know, like we have, you know, the church has vigils for everything, right? We, we hold on to certain um, items from mm -hmm. history and say we, we hold these up and we venerate these almost, right? Why couldn't they hold on to the autographs? And to that, you know, I would point them to the fact that, well, think about what, what document, what paper they were using at the time, right? And you, you mentioned earlier is that they were using papyrus. And... Paper is not like the paper we have today, obviously. It was a very expensive process, a time-consuming process. And so if you wanted to write something down, number one, you need to make sure that the, the topic you're writing about is, is worthy enough, first of all. Is, is it worth spending a whole lot of money to create a whole lot of papyri to form, form a bunch of pages so that I can write down the life of a person? So papyrus is made from, you know, little strings of the papyrus plant, and you crisscross them together and all, very tightly and allow them to dry. It's a very time-consuming process, and you can always, always uh, all, at the end of it, you can put ink to the papyrus. And again, this is not quality paper, even to begin with. So it's only going to last maybe a century at the most. If it's, if it's not handled, you know, being handed off from hand to hand, it could last up to a century. And that's with good climate conditions as well. And so this paper, it totally makes sense that we would not have the autographs either way. They just would have disintegrated, okay? Now, thankfully, as we're gonna show in a little bit, we do have very early manuscripts, but a lot of the manuscripts that we do have are of parchment, and that's actually made from animal skin, which is a whole lot more durable, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, a very, it's very interesting if you would look into um, the methods that were used to just record ancient documents in general. And you can definitely make sense of why we don't have the autographs today. But do the copies that we have, can we get a good sense of what the originals actually said? And are those really accurate and precise? So why don't we uh, share a little bit of the information that we got about the manuscript count that we have today and maybe show a little bit of the manuscripts that we have. Sounds good. You want to talk numbers, though, right? Yeah, I guess, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> we have pictures for Bungie. <laughs> I need pictures. <laughs> so 
Talk about New Testament, right? Um, <clears throat> again, a historian is looking for documents that are as close to the events, but it would also definitely help if they had a number of these manuscripts. So talking about the New Testament uh, alone, Greek manuscripts. So these are manuscripts obviously written uh, in the language of Greek. We have uh, at least uh, as, it's hard to kind of come down on a certain number, but as best as we can tell, we have over 5,800 manuscripts just in the Greek language alone, okay? Now these, a manuscript, it doesn't have to be an entire book. It doesn't have to be an entire chapter. It can literally be, as we'll show in a little bit, a fragment just a couple of centimeters wide um, and long. So a fragment, it, it, could, it could be this, this small, just a couple centimeters, or it can be an entire book, bound book of an entire book of the Bible, like Isaiah or something like that. But in the Greek language, we have over 5,800 manuscripts. Now, talking about non-Greek manuscripts, as Bungie was talking about a little bit earlier, there's Latin, uh, there's other, uh, other languages uh, found in the Far East. Ethiopic, uh, Coptic, Coptic yep. Armenian. Yeah, so uh, all these non-Greek manuscripts... Slavic. That we have, <laughs> Slavic, there you go. Nice. It's one of my favorites. Nice. So we have upwards of over 18,000 manuscripts. So these are definitely hundreds, uh, if not over a millennia old. So these are not quite as old as the papyrus, but um, some of them can get back into the 3rd and 4th century, which is still, historically speaking, it's, it's not bad. So total manuscripts that we have of the New Testament alone uh, range almost close to 24,000. 24,000 manuscripts in the New Testament alone. Now, okay, well, that's just a number in the vacuum. What does that mean? Can we compare it to anything else? Well, the next ancient document that, that has the most manuscripts that we can count today and that we can compare it to is Homer's Iliad. Now, this is something that was written even before the time of Christ. Was that written by Jeremy's dad? I think so. Yeah. Right? Is that right? So Homer's Iliad is uh, purported to be written, have been written in 800 BC. Okay, so can we find any manuscripts that are, you know, somewhat close to that? Uh, well, the total amount of manuscripts that we have for Homer's Iliad uh, is approaching 2,000, but it stands at around uh, 1,757 right now. The earliest manuscript that we have for Homer's Iliad is 400 BC. So that's, if you do the math, that's 400 years separated from the original time that it was supposed to be written. So a, a gap of time, yep. 400 years between the autograph and the first manuscript copy. Yes. And again, generally speaking, historians agree that it was Homer who wrote it, and they agree about the details that were, are found in it. Homer Valencia. Yeah, Homer oh, Valencia. It's yeah. crazy. You wouldn't believe it. It's incredible. <laughs> so for, keep, that, keep that number in mind. 400 years gap, and yet, generally speaking, it's found to be historically reliable, okay? And, and what's the closest gap between uh, the autograph and uh, the first New Testament manuscript? Well, that's what we're going to jump into. Our first manuscript, the earliest one that we have, is a manuscript that is known as uh, the John Rylands Papyrus, otherwise known as P52. Uh, that's the way it was categorized. And this is one of those that is just a few centimeters uh, wide and tall, and it has just a fragment of the Gospel of John, chapter 18, and this dates all the way back to the year 130 A.D., give okay. or take, about 15 years or so. So it could be as early as 115 A.D., okay? Now, keep this in mind also. This is the Gospel of John. Gospel of John is probably generally agreed to have been completed in about 90 A.D., latest, right? So this is the Apostle John who was exiled, island of Patmos, but he wrote a gospel. And this is the, the more later of the, of the four gospels that was, uh, that was written. And so historians say about 90 AD. So that puts us around 25 to 40 years after the gospel of John was written. And we have a, a papyrus fragment of John chapter 18. Now, I'm not saying this is the autograph, but at the very least, it could definitely be one of the first copies of the original autograph, sure. given about how long papyrus fragments can last in different climate conditions and yep. whatnot. 
So compare that just immediately. Homer's Iliad, the, the time gap that we have to the oldest manuscript is 400 years. And that is considered generally to be historically reliable. Right. For the New Testament, we have something that is dating to within 40 years. Okay? So either a disciple of John or somebody that knew John directly could have been carrying this papyrus fragment. Right. Okay. Well, you could say this is just one, one fragment. Big whoop. You know, uh, show me more. Right? Okay. okay. Let's show you more. Let's go to P90. Not P90X. <laughs> I, I forget the dude's name. Anyways, <laughs> bad joke. <laughs> Couldn't do it. This, uh, manu this manuscript, this fragment, dates to the second century. And this is another uh, fragment about the Gospel of John, chapter 18, on one side, and then John, chapter 19, one verse, a fragment of a verse uh, of John, chapter 19, on the other side. So remember, you know, these parchments... Uh, the papyrus, rather, they're they're not that they're not that large, so uh, you can you can only fit so much on one side and have to go to to another verse on the other side. And this was actually, uh, interestingly enough, was found near an ancient garbage dump in Egypt. Yeah, how about that, that goes to your point about you know it wasn't the Christians mishandling their scriptures; it was really the persecution that was the cause of a lot of the ancient documents being burned in a fire, right. just being thrown away, or being misused. But we actually found a fragment dating back to the second century. Again, a Gospel of John. This is P90 again. It's just a tiny little fragment there. Yep. Another fragment that we have is P104. This is again dated to the second century. This is a, a, a third one now. And now this is actually the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 21, a few uh, verses 34 through 37 on the front, 43 and 45 on the back. But dated to the second century. And the last one, uh, again, just a, another second century fragment that we have are parts of Revelation. This is known as P98. And parts of Revelation chapter 1, dated back to the second century, likely copied within 100 years of the original again. Revelation, again, being another one of those latecomers into the canon, or rather being finished, completed late again in the 90s. So this could very well be a copy of the original autograph. And so again, if you're, if you're a skeptic out there, if you're talking about, well, this, this has been transmitted incorrectly, you know, we have fragments of verses that we can actually say, this is actually what those verses said. And they date back to the early second century. Right. Does this not count as evidence? It should count as evidence. It does. And th this is what historians are looking for. When, when these, when these uh, papyrus fragments were found, I mean, this, this really just made, it made shockwaves throughout the, the, the history departments because this is what historians are looking for. Right. Documents that are as close to the events as possible. And if they consider uh, the, the first manuscript uh, evidence of Homer valid, mm -hmm. or the Iliad, uh, you, you know, if, if a 400-year gap is still considered valid, well, then I would assume that a 40 to 100 year gap would be even more valid. Yep. Seems, oh. It seems like the smaller the gap, uh, the more likely uh, that it's a, it's a valid uh, uh, manuscript from, from the original autograph. Uh, and not only that, but it, since these are manuscripts, mm -hmm. copies of the autograph uh, in the early uh, to mid uh, to late, uh, you know, second century. What are they copying from except a first century autograph? Right. Yep. And if you have a first century autograph, you have people writing in the time period where eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ still still are alive when when the the record is being recorded. Right. Uh, so with with that being the case, you know, if you still have eyewitnesses walking around, and you don't find them arguing against what's being recorded in the original autograph uh, then seems to suggest that what's being written and recorded in the New Testament books, especially you know concerning the life of Jesus Christ as, as detailed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, seems to me that you know there's not enough time to create fables of fantasy mm -hmm. and there's there's no uh, evidence of you know a skeptic, or a contrarian coming along saying that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, are creating works of fiction. 
so it seems to me like we've got valid eyewitness testimonies uh, that were yeah. written early uh, and should be accepted as, as reliable. Yeah, you know, this brings up, a, you know, just an extra note here about, and what we do find in other ancient writers, people who were not necessarily fans of Christians, what we do find in, is them affirming yeah. details about what was written in the New Testament or, or names of characters. Number one being James, the brother of Jesus, mm -hmm. as well as Jesus and, and his crucifixion. So, you know, I might be talking a little bit to the Jesus Smithers, the ones that believe that Jesus didn't exist. Right. And you point out these ancient writers like Pliny the Younger and Tacitus and Josephus, mm -hmm. of course, who are writing within that time frame. Right. Where you have either eyewitnesses or disciples of these eyewitnesses who can confirm a lot of these details. And they're affirming the characters. They're affirming Jesus died at the, uh, by Pontius Pilate and all the way it all went down. Right. And they have no skin in the game. They didn't, they didn't have to record these events. There was, no, there was nothing in it for them. Right. And they were, many times they were opposers of Christianity, but they were simply recording history as it was going as down. It, as it was, yeah. So, you know, we, we took a look at, you know, a handful of the earliest fragments of yeah. manuscripts, uh, but just to sum up what you had said earlier, so we have close to 6,000 complete or fragmented Greek manuscripts. We have uh, upwards of 10,000 Latin manuscripts. Uh, as well as 9,300 manuscripts in other ancient languages, including Slavic, Ethiopic, Coptic, and Armenian. Uh, and, and as we add all of that up, we have close to, uh, or actually a little bit more than 23,000 manuscripts of the New Testament in part or whole, uh, many which can be dated to the second and third centuries. Yeah. What a massive amount of manuscript evidence for the reliability uh, of the New Testament. So the question is then, you know, uh, uh, you know, do those manuscripts have the same text that we have today? Mm -hmm. um, but before we before we advance to that, I would just also point out that another piece of evidence is that the church fathers mm -hmm. were notorious for quoting the scriptures in their own works, in their own books, in their own epistles. Right. So the church fathers come along, you know, after the apostles, and uh, and, and they start quoting from these New Testament documents. Uh, according to one expert on this, we could uh, reconstruct the entire New Testament from the writings of the church fathers alone. If you just go in and take all of their quotations, you could reconstruct the majority of the New Testament uh, just from their quotations. Yeah. So uh, with that being the case, we can be certain then that the biblical Jesus and the historical Jesus are the same. And the reason why I point that out is because, you know, there are many who come along and they want to say that there is a... Uh, there's a historical Jesus, the Jesus that literally lived there in the first century. Then there's the biblical Jesus, which is uh, made up of fantasy and fable long after the fact. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the more we narrow the gap of, of, of uh, you know, the, the autograph to the life of Jesus, the more we narrow that gap, uh, the more unlikely it is that we have a fictional Jesus that is different from the historical Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, autographs obviously written in the first century, not uh, dismissed by contemporary historians, but supported by them, mm -hmm. like Pliny the Younger and Josephus and, and Tacitus. You know, we find the confirmations uh, of their writings, not, you know, the opposition. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and so what we have then is a, is a really good idea that the, the Bible provides us with reliable information about the historical Jesus, that he literally did these miracles, that he literally rose up from the grave, that he literally claimed to be uh, God incarnate who came to die for the sins of, of mankind, providing that the transmission of information from the original autograph to today's modern Bible remains the same. Right. So if there is alteration in the information from the autograph till today, it doesn't, it wouldn't matter if you had early manuscripts, if what the, the original manuscripts contained by way of information has been altered throughout the ages. Right. Right. So is, is there, you know, can, can we look at these manuscripts and say that the Bible we have today in English is accurate to the uh, oldest manuscripts? I think so. And this gets into another issue that historians look into 
which is called variance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So picture this where you have the first century church and you have the original autographs and they're being delivered to churches to be, to be read. But then as this gospel message, as the, as the early Christian church is growing in number and now it's expanding into different regions of the world, you have a need now for copies of these autographs to be transmitted to those locations. So copies are being made. Now, <clears throat> it's being copied by men, of course. There's, there's going to be imperfections, what historians call variants or, or little uh, minute changes. It could be as small as just a, a spelling difference. Or it could be something as large as an omission or an insertion of an idea of one of the scribes copying down the manuscript, the new manuscript, to be passed on. So these are all count, count, counting as variants, no matter how small and no matter how large. And so these are being spread throughout the years, throughout the centuries in different lands, you know, as far away as Egypt, all the way to Spain, uh, all the way to the Far East, and even further north. So these are being spread throughout. And as we mentioned, we have tens of thousands of manuscripts in those different languages, and they're found in different parts of the world. And what, we, what historians have noticed is that ultimately, there are about 400,000 variants. Now, wow. uh, as Bart Ehrman, he's a popular New Testament scholar out in uh, University of North Carolina, I believe he's still there, but he's a, a about agnostic or yeah. agnostic atheist. And he actually went to a very conservative Bible uh, university to study New Testament history. And he studied under one of the most famous uh, New Testament historians, Bruce Metzger, uh, while he was in school. And one of his uh, you know, lines that he likes to throw out in debates or even just in general is saying that there are more variants than there are words in the New Testament. And this is supposed to come as a shock value and say, whoa, if there's more variants than there are words in the New Testament, then that's got to throw the whole reliability of the New Testament to question. Right. How can there be more variants, more changes in the structure of the New Testament than there are words in the New Testament? How does that even make sense? That's, that's got to bring some trouble to the Christian. And again, this is where we have to understand what how historians actually view variants. So imagine out of all these tens of thousands of manuscripts that we have, so for instance, let's say one's going to, one group of uh, manuscripts are being copied and they're spreading more to the west and another family of manuscripts is spreading more to the east. The ones going to the west are gonna have a lot of the more similar sorts of variants. And that's how you can kind of track down essentially, oh, okay, this is actually being traced throughout this whole region and this time frame. And this family is having these similar variants uh, throughout their manuscripts. So for historians, it's, it's not really a big deal because wouldn't you believe that for a historian, the more manuscripts that you have, the more variants that you have, it actually helps the historian get back to what the original reading most likely was. Now, how does that make sense? Well, let me explain it this way. A popular illustration that's used is say, let's say you have a recipe a famous recipe of, your, of yours, and you want to share it with your friends. And you write down, let's say, 12 different paper, on 12 different papers, 12 copies of that same recipe. And throughout your copying, you made little mistakes here. You made a mistake about this, the spelling of a, certain, uh, of a certain ingredient, like cinnamon versus simonin or something like that. Or maybe you even made a mistake on some of the amounts, teaspoons versus tablespoons, or cups versus quarts, or something like that. And these, are, these variants are being uh, passed out through these different recipe copies that you're passing out to your friends. Now, each of these friends, they receive it and they say, well, this doesn't look right. So they get together with the other friends and they compare notes. And in those comparing notes, they can say, oh, well, obviously it's not cinnamon. That doesn't exist. It's cinnamon. I can get back to the original reading. Well, uh, it doesn't make sense for me to put you know, two gallons of something when it actually calls for two cups but I see that this one actually has cups, so that makes more sense. I can get back to the original reading. And guess what? The more copies that are made, the more variants, it's much easier to deduce what was the actual original autograph uh, saying. So the number of variants is actually a pro. Historians 
like the fact that there's so many variants. That means, number one, we have a ton of manuscripts of which to choose from. Imagine we only had one ancient copy, and it had a bunch, imagine it had tens of thousands of variants. Yeah. One copy, you'd be left dumbfounded. You'd say, well, I, I really don't know what to do with this. I don't know if this is the original, but the more copies that you have, that's actually, you can kind of uh, compare and contrast and see, oh, this is most likely the original reading. So ultimately, 400,000 variants, that's a scare tactic. Right. But it, it actually helps the Christian, it helps the historian get back to the original reading. Yeah, I, I've heard it uh, like, uh, let's say you take an ancient document like the Constitution. You know, you take the United States Constitution and there's one copy made, right? But then chances are, you know, other guys wanted... Uh, uh, wanted their own copy, right? So they they handwritten, you know, they, they they took the time to to write down their own copy of the U.S. Constitution, right? And and, and so with all of these uh, copies being made, uh, you know, if the original Constitution were destroyed, like let's say some nefarious politician came along, you know, pick your favorite, and they destroyed the Constitution, got rid of the original document. Well, it's been copied so many times. I mean, I'm even just looking at, at the internet here with all the pictures of it, right? You know, but getting back to the actual illustration of hand copies, uh, not not the not the photographs or or, or the, yeah. uh, the the professional copied, but but the hand copied uh, versions. Uh, you know, these were uh, hand copied by A students, B students, C students. <laughs> My friends. <laughs> so uh, then you could come along and you could look at the hand copy and determine which one is more valid based on the number of mistakes, mm -hmm. right? If you find a bunch of spelling errors and then there's sentence structure issues in that same hand copy mm -hmm. versus this one that has less spelling errors well, the sentence structure of this one's probably gonna be better as well. So you can start you know, giving uh, more weight to certain copies yep. just based on the kind of errors that you find in it, mm -hmm. right? So that's another aspect of, of looking at the variants and coming to conclusions about you know, which of these copies might hold more weight uh, and be more accurate. Which ones should we look to or lean on more versus others that might have issues? But uh, but with all when we have you know what was it uh, twenty three thousand yeah. manuscripts six thousand Greek alone mm -hmm. that's a lot that, that that's a, a lot to pick from. Imagine that uh, you know you have your original copy of the Constitution and someone like let's just say I don't know Nancy Pelosi comes along and, and tears it up and burns it. Um, so uh, we can take all of the the copies that that were made after the fact and figure out what the original constitution actually said mm -hmm. wi without having the uh, the original autograph. And that's what we're doing. That, that's what the scholars do yeah. when they come and they look at all of the different manuscripts. They can use the thousands and thousands of manuscripts that we have and present us with what I believe to be a 99.9999% uh, accurate mm -hmm. Uh, version that is that it's that close to the original autograph 99.9 percent .9%. yeah so what about that one percent what what are we actually talking about here well, when we come to that that point one percent discrepancy or variation what kind of mistakes are we talking about yeah so this is where a uh, a skeptic would then say yeah well but not all variants are the same right you know, there are spelling errors, I'll give you that. But what if there was a person with an agenda and they wanted to um, em emphasize certain attributes of Jesus or maybe kind of uh, make him a legend, so to speak? You know, throw in a little miracle here, throw in some good deeds here. Mm -hmm. Did they actually change the meaning of any essential doctrines of Christianity with these variants? And again, going um, referring back to Bruce Metzger and Bart Ehrman, who wrote co-wrote a book together, scholarly book, and they came to the conclusion that well over half of the variants, so out of the 400,000, well over 200,000 of them are just mere spelling errors. Okay. Now there are also word order type of variants, so swapping of the words. 
which are easy to spot because the grammar won't make sense too much. But again, out of the thousands of manuscripts that you have, it's easy to get back into what the original uh, autograph said. And then there's also meaningful but non-viable variants. So for instance, uh, you have insertions of a scribe. So let's say he wants to uh, clarify in his own words when he's copying the, the manuscript. He says, well, this, this really doesn't make sense to me. And I'm just going to insert it here just to make the reader of this ma new manuscript, just to make it a little bit more clear for them. So he goes ahead and inserts his own commentary, so to speak. And this actually did hap this happen, most likely I'm um, referring to 1 John 5, verse 7. If you open up your Bible right now, you'll see that it seems to be a very clear um, indication of the Trinity. You know, there's, there's three that bear witness in heaven, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right. right? Most likely historians see this as an insertion from a scribal, uh, scribal error. Now that's significant, because right. if the Trinity were explicitly in the Bible, man, it's a done deal. And the, the skeptic might point to that and say, aha, therefore the Trinity is a no-go. Well, that's not, that's not true. We have other ways of arriving at the Trinity. Right. So that's a meaningful uh, variant, but it's non-viable. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really impact in the end. We, but, see, we see something similar in the, uh, in the end of Mark. Yeah, yes. You see inserted information from probably from a scribe, well-meaning scribe, uh, that is probably not in the original autograph. But it's not information that isn't found in the book already. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not an addition of information necessarily. But it is. Uh, I, I guess maybe Mark didn't know how to conclude his book according to one scribe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> and thought let's <laughs> let's clean up this ending here. Yeah, you yeah. know, <laughs> and uh, but uh, I think that he maybe some scribe came along and decided to sum up. Yeah. You know, give a little word of encouragement or something. Whatever the whatever the reasoning, uh, it was added in after the autograph, mm -hmm. but it doesn't add any new information, or right. or or challenge any information that you find in the in the Gospel of Mark. Or even it doesn't challenge even any essential beliefs of Christianity as That's well, right. right? Another one would be in John chapter seven, the woman at the well, and again, just based on how many manuscripts this certain account, the woman at the well, when he encounters her and, you know, she's had how many husbands and he says, you know, you're forgiven, go say no more. Th how many manuscripts, this is only found in a handful of manuscripts and they're only found, that account is only found in later manuscripts. Right. The earliest manuscripts omit this. And so again, if you have a, a, a good Bible on hand that has footnotes, you might see notes about this whole passage is omitted in certain manuscripts or is only found in later manuscripts. So uh, this also goes to the skeptic that says, well, Christians are, are they're not wanting the, the general population to know about this. You know, they're mm -hmm. willingly passing on fables and lies and blah, blah, blah. Well, no, we, any, any Bible that's worth its salt is actually producing these footnotes. They're saying, yeah, they're found in manuscripts, so we include it because it ultimately might be in the original autographs, but we're up front with you and saying it's omitted from this family of manuscripts and it's, and it's only found in later manuscripts, that kind of stuff. And the beautiful thing about the whole thing is that there are so many manuscripts that we can identify these variations. Yeah. And so those are those meaningful but non-viable ones, but then there are the, the viable ones, the ones that seem to challenge... <clears throat> uh, you know, certain doctrine, and that makes up uh, less than 1% right. of the variance. So let's say less than 4,000 out of the 400,000. And ultimately, according to uh, not only Bruce Metzger and Bart Ehrman, but also other historians and theologians, these are theologically insignificant. So they do change the meaning of the text to be something, you know, significantly different, but ultimately theologically insignificant. So they don't impact essential Christian doctrine. So all the Christian doctrine that we have that we consider essential, like the deity of Jesus Christ, the Trinity, the, uh, the, the high view, uh, high Christology and high view of scripture, that kind of stuff, the only being one God, you know, the essential ones, how to, how to attain salvation, that kind of stuff. Uh, none of these errors, the less than 1% of variants, uh, argue with any of these uh, theologically essential doctrines of Christianity. So in the end, even Bart Ehrman himself, again, the agnostic atheist uh, New Testament scholar out of North Carolina, he admits in one of his own books called Misquoting Jesus at the end, he says, most of the changes found in our early Christian manuscripts have nothing to do with theology or ideology. Far and away, the most 
The most changes are the result of mistakes, pure and simple, slips of the pen, accidental omissions, inadvertent additions, misspelled words, blunders of one sort or another. He, they admit it, and ultimately him and Bruce Metzger admitted that uh, you can actually get back to 99% accuracy of yep. the original New Testament. That's right. Based on the manuscript evidence. And so again, hopefully this is really, you're hope, hopefully feeling the force of this evidence, not only the manuscripts, but also the, the transparency of the variants. Yes, there are variants. Yes, Christian, I, I hope I didn't burst the bubble, but this also does not impact inerrancy and infallibility, as we right. were talking earlier. We're not talking about the original autographs. We're talking about the copies, but even the variants that exist within those copies, we have a good, solid understanding of what was most likely the original um, wording of, of these passages that have all these variants. So in the end, it's not like, I like to pick on Jehovah's Witnesses tonight for some reason, but <laughs> you look at their translation, New World Translation, or even you look at, there's a lot of uh, good work being done on uh, Islam right now and the history of the Quran and how that came to be. And they have, a, they have the same problems. Every ancient document is going to have these problems of variance and, and number of manuscripts. By and large, Christianity, the New Testament, the Bible, stands far, in a, you know, head and shoulders above the rest of any ancient document in terms of accuracy, in terms of just the wealth of evidence for it. And so we can get back to the originals with a great degree of confidence. You can't say the same for even Jehovah's Witnesses who won't include footnotes into the, as to the additions or the changes made uh, to suit their theology. If you ever talk to a Jehovah's Witness, that you'll have a field day with that. Uh, and even Islam, the good work being done today about the number of different uh, number of Qurans, the different variants found in the Qurans, and, and how theologically or how historically accurate those can be. And not to mention that, uh, you know, they, they don't even accept uh, English translations as being valid. Yes, <laughs> as well, yep. So there's that. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, as we consider, like, all the manuscripts dating back to the, even as early as the second century uh, and, and the early se second century, uh, and, and, you know, my guess is that we're going to be finding, as, uh, the more we dig, the more we're going to find earlier and earlier manuscripts. But, uh, but just sticking with what we have right now, which is, you know, all the way back to the early, you know, second century, uh, which, uh, as you pointed out with the, the fragment uh, of John uh, P. Uh, 50, I think it was, or 52. P52, P52, um, you know, that being within 40 years of the original autograph, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and with these being copies of the autographs, it kind of forces the autographs into the first century. If we find these in the first century, then what's the likelihood that they were actually written by the eyewitnesses? Yep. It, it can, can we believe you know, that Matthew was actually written by the Apostle Matthew, because there are some works out there, like the Gospel of Thomas, which, you know, was written in the, what, uh, late 3rd, early 4th century, yeah. and, and uh, you know, clearly that's not, you know, the Thomas that we find in the Bible. Right. You know, this is not the work of an eyewitness. This is a, a Gnostic work mm -hmm. being written, you know, hundreds of years later. Uh, so when we come to Matthew, can we believe that the Apostle Matthew wrote Matthew? Uh, when, it, when it comes to Mark, when it comes to, to John, can we say these guys were eyewitnesses? When, uh, uh, when, when Luke says he interviewed the eyewitnesses, can we believe that this is actually the physician Luke who actually interviewed those eyewitnesses? Uh, you know, it, it, the Bible certainly seems to, to support this belief, and the evidence uh, certainly supports it as well. Uh, you know, I, you know. I know that uh, the, uh, Paul was quite clear in First Corinthians 15. You know mm -hmm. that uh, that there were 500 eyewitnesses who saw the resurrection of Jesus, uh, who were still alive when he wrote First Corinthians, which is a, a one of the earliest New Testament works written. Yeah. You know, First Corinthians, and so here we find you know Paul claiming to be an eyewitness, because he says that he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Mm -hmm. So Paul here in 1 Corinthians 15 is claiming to be an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, or, or Jesus in his resurrected state. state. Yeah. Uh, and, and then goes on to tell us that the 12 were witnesses of this, and there were uh, over 500 brethren who were also eyewitnesses. And so is 1 Corinthians the work of an eyewitness who is also claiming that there were many other eyewitnesses? <clears throat> Yeah, that's good. And even Paul, he mentions some of those 500 
who are not yet asleep, meaning they're still not, alive. They're still alive. All, you're basically inviting people who are reading this, go and find them, go talk to them, back it up. Because in that same chapter, and I like bringing this up to whomever I'm talking about, the reliability, Paul makes a historical claim about Christianity. And he basically hinges Christianity on this one claim. He says, if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, we are to, we are to be pitied above all. Yep. We are still dead in our sins. If, we, if Jesus has not risen from the dead, Christianity is false. So imagine a whole religion hinging upon a historical fact. And so this is why another reason why the reliability of the New Testament in question is so important. It's vital importance to, to everyone. If this is historical fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and if he did in fact rise from the dead, then that validates his ministry. That validates all the things that he was saying about the world, about God, about himself, and ultimately our eternal destination, right? So yes, can we figure out, was the New Testament written by eyewitnesses? And again, this is where I hear another claim from skeptics. Well, you know, eyewitness testimony can't be trusted, right? <laughs> yeah. Just just simple yeah. blank assertion like that. Blanket assertion is eyewitness testimony just thrown out immediately out the... Right out, right out the gate, can't trust it. And why is this? You know, where, where did this come from? I'm guessing, you know, there's courtroom where eyewitnesses and lawyers do a really bang up job of trying to figure out how to discredit eyewitnesses. And a lot of times in this day and age, of course, it's, it's not that hard with social media. <laughs> yeah. You just have to find out one lie, one thing that they did in their past to at least legally invalidate the eyewitness, right? Yep. But again, as a historian, how do we figure out whether the eyewitnesses were telling the truth or not? And, and even the, the New Testament, before I go any further, New Testament itself purports to have been, um, have events that were recorded by eyewitnesses. So for instance, in Acts chapter two, uh, verse 32, uh, I believe this is Peter, he's talking to a crowd, and he says, this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. So he's talking to a Boom. large crowd, He's saying, you yourself are witness of this Jesus that God raised up. Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 16. And I love this because he's actually just kind of going above and beyond and trying to tell you we're not writing fairy tale. He says, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Love it. So he puts himself on the line. He says, if I'm lying, I'm dying, right? If I'm lying to you, then all these things that I'm telling you are, are a bunch of lies as well. We were eyewitnesses. This is how you can trust us. We were with him. We were with him those three years of his ministry and ultimately witnessed his death, uh, burial, and resurrection, you know, physical resurrection. When Paul was on trial, uh, he, he was brought in before uh, Festus, and, uh, and, and as he shared his testimony about you know uh, finding himself face-to-face -face with Jesus on the road to Damascus, uh, Festus said to him, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason for the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. He didn't say, no, you made it all up. <laughs> yeah. This is all, no, everybody knows that you guys are lying about all of this yeah. stuff, right? It, it, no. He says, I'm almost persuaded. Mm -hmm. Nobody puts Paul in the corner. No, no <laughs> nobody puts Paul in the corner. <laughs> That's right. These things were not done in a corner. They were done, again, if this, those contemporaries, when, when the Gospels were being written, when Paul's letters were being written, contemporaries opposing Christianity were still alive. And they were the ones still in power. They could have easily just pointed, this is Jesus' tomb. Or they could have said, Jesus never existed. I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah. This, none of this stuff ever happened. They could have written their own documents to quell any sort of rebellion that might come up from Christianity that they were scared of. Quell, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. I like that. So rather, anyways, bad jokes all around. They purported to be eyewitnesses. So are eyewitness testimonies easily invalidated? Well, not so fast, right? And this is what I like to point out whenever a person brings this up. Most likely, the person who says eyewitness testimony is untrustworthy. 
does not live their life as if that's the case. Right. When they call their parents, you know, usually we're talking to university students, so I like to tell them, you know, when you call your parents and they tell you what they had for breakfast that morning, do you start, you know, going after them and telling them, nah, uh I don't believe you. That's eyewitness testimony. How, how can you even prove that to me? Do you, do you start automatically going with that assumption that eyewitness testimony? Oh, your father did this or your mother did that the, the other day. Was it, it was so funny. I don't believe a single word is coming out of your mouth, you liar. They don't live their life in such a way that they believe that eyewitness testimony is untrustworthy. Rather, what we generally believe is that the vast amount of history that we have is eyewitness testimony. And really what a historian does is it gives the benefit of the doubt to the author until some other evidence comes along and shows that certain details of their story are incorrect. And that's usually the way we treat eyewitness testimony. Yeah. Even in the court of law. Yes, you have your testimony, you can sign an affidavit, but ultimately do we have some supporting evidence to show that the details you, you spoke of, are they most likely correct? So don't like, like, like if you see if you see you know a poll worker running ballots through a machine two and three times, mm -hmm. an eyewitness can report that. But if you have video of that, you know that's even stronger evidence. But yeah. uh, but it doesn't discredit. If you don't have the video, it doesn't you discredit gonna, the eyewitness. You but do? you know I'm just I'm just saying. I mean this yeah, yeah. hypothetical. Are you gonna believe right. your lion eyes? <laughs> so yeah, we have to we have to have equal scales basically. Are we treating all eyewitness testimony the same way you purport to believe you know, it's untrustworthy? I don't think so. So then why don't you give the authors the benefit of the doubt, historians do, and then wait until some opposing evidence comes and then you can say, oh, this detail was incorrect. But don't just automatically in, you know, make this broad sweeping generalization about eyewitness testimony. That's not the way we, we historians do it and that's not the way even the courts do it, okay? But, Ultimately, another question arises from this is, well, the, de the kinds of details that the, the Gospels give or Paul's letters give or the writers of the New Testament give, how could they remember all these events? How could they remember all these details right. over the number of years, right? Because we're talking about at least 20 years separated from the purported events. Is it possible to remember those amount of, that amount of details about Jesus and even some of the personal conversations he had and that kind of stuff? You know, I, I would, I would say, first of all, knowing that we're about to wrap this up, I would mm -hmm. just say, first of all, we all have photographic memories. The question is recall, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, so, you know, did these guys have perfect recall of everything? And I would say probably not. Most of us don't. Uh, but here's what Jesus said in John chapter 14. Uh, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So here you have Jesus saying, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to help you do the very things that I need you to do, including uh, writing the, you know, the stories of everything that you experienced here. And then Peter later on goes and says that we've had confirmation that the Holy Spirit has moved us along mm -hmm. in this way, uh, which is why we believe that the Holy Spirit is the one who has inspired the word of God, though it came through uh, the, the, the pen of, of men. Yeah. And then it's, it, you know, another related question is, why did Jesus choose this time in this culture mm. to write that, right? And another big reason I, I, I feel that this might be the case is that in that culture, oral transmission of details was heavily emphasized. Sure. You know, obviously we, we live in the digital age where, you know, a lot of us maybe remember phone numbers growing up, but nowadays I, yeah. I don't remember any numbers. I don't care anymore. So I just store them in context. But back then, memorization of large chunks of text was crucial in order to pass down tradition, in order to pass down teachings. And consider this, Jesus, to his disciples, to his followers, was known as rabbi. He was known as teacher. Hmm. And the way he spoke to his disciples was in, you know, didactic form. He said, he, he mentioned a bunch of parables. Right. He, he broke things down to kind of a formulaic way, method, such that it was easily digestible. And so, I mean, if you're with him for three years and he's personally teaching you, I mean, it definitely makes sense that a lot of those teachings would be easily accessible to the memory. Sure. But then also, 
what we notice is, like what you mentioned earlier, with Luke and with the other gospel writers, they made it a point, if they were not an eyewitness himself, Luke, you know, went along with Paul. Um, Matthew was a tax collector and also known as Levi. Um, so they made it a point to go and interview right. eyewitnesses. They, they went and interviewed most likely Mary. They went and interviewed the disciples and all the people that followed Jesus. Yes. And that's how they can get a lot of these uh, details correct. Yep. So, again, historians usually come down on this conclusion is that, yeah, these, these guys really did a great job of recording history. And you find it in the actual details that they wrote. Down to the names of people, down to their positions that they held in government or within the city and the community, uh, the locations, and just little details about the locations. The seasons, what, what color the, the grass was at the time. They, it was very clear that these people were writing in the time that they purport to write. Uh, so a bunch of historians have come to the conclusion, yes, these were eyewitnesses. Mm. And we can trust what they're saying about that time period and about the people they're writing about. So, yeah, like you said, we, we do have to wrap this up right now to get into our Q&A, but we have a large thread. You're talking about kind of like the chain of custody that the New Testament documents have to go through, and can we trace that back? But we have a large thread, I think, that we've built up here to, to really drive home the point that the New Testament documents are not only reliable, but ultimately we can make also another argument showing that, yes, they are inspired, by God, as Second Timothy chapter three right. mentions, right? And so, for the skeptic, and even for the Christian out there who may not even be aware of a lot of these details, maybe until you know before tonight, hopefully this encourages you now to take hopefully a second look at the evidence. Maybe you didn't know that there's a bunch of manuscripts, and maybe you didn't know the way historians are looking at this evidence, and they're actually just drooling over the amount of evidence that the New Testament has. And, and we haven't even gotten into like archaeology and prophecy, like what you were talking about. Maybe we can get into that in the Q&A right now. But there, uh, one historian put it, I think it was Bruce Metzger, but he, he put it this way. There is an embarrassment of riches when it comes to the reliability of the New Testament. Again, 99% accuracy. What, what other ancient document can you give that a degree of confidence to in terms of its reliability and authenticity and, and genuineness? No other ancient document, you know, they all pale in comparison. Again, the, the next one that we have is Homer's Iliad. But there's an embarrassment of riches for the New Testament. So hopefully that encourages you. Hopefully at least that just spurs you on to dig a little deeper and maybe revisit some of the misconceptions that you may have about the reliability of the New Testament. You have anything to add, Bungie? I think you did it, man. I did it. You knocked it out of the park. There it is, like Babe Ruth. Baby Ruthie. <laughs> All right. So at this moment, I do want to just remind everybody we're, we're about to enter into our Q&A portion of the discussion. Um, you're streaming live from YouTube or perhaps you're watching us on cable access channel 11 here in Austin. Again, if you have any questions, we do have that live chat going on in YouTube, youtube.com slash Calvary South Austin. Feel free to share the link, subscribe, you know, hit the little notification bell. Make sure you don't miss another episode, but uh, engage with us there in the live chat. If you have any questions, uh, chime in. Uh, for those that are watching on Cable Access Channel 11, you can call your question in. We'll queue it up uh, at 512-576-5433. And again, I do want to remind you all, we're here at Calvary South Austin in Austin, Texas. We've opened up the doors of our church. Uh, we've taken all the necessary safety measures during this time to make sure that we're worshiping here and fellowshipping here safely. So please come on and join us. We have uh, services on Sunday mornings at 9.15 a.m. and 11.15 a.m as well as Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Uh, if you're feeling a little timid even, we, we do have a, a room designated for those high-risk individuals. So, uh, you know, we, again, we're, we've, taken the, we've gone above and beyond with the safety measures we're, going, uh, we're doing here. We just want to make sure everybody feels safe. So come on by. If you have any questions, feel free to call the church. Again, that number is 512-576-5433. Uh, but, so we just wrapped up our discussion portion, and we're getting into our Q&A about the reliability of the New Testament. So we do have a couple questions queued up here. Number one says, hey guys, hey to you. Good talk and info. What would you guys say to people who assert that the Bible used by Protestants is incomplete or missing books? 
uh, namely Catholics who have seven extra books? Mm. Uh, very good question. Um, so I guess maybe let me read the following up here. Uh, my Catholic friend brought up issues with Martin Luther removing the extra books, stating Luther also wanted to remove Revelation and James. Oh, conspiracy. All mm -hmm. right, here we go. So talking about the uh, deuterocanonical books found in the Catholic Bible. Not the pseudepigraphals. Not the pseudepigraphals. <laughs> Not the extra canonical. <laughs> A lot well, of big words being thrown around. Well, we do have, you know, a bit of a loaded, not that the questioner is presenting a loaded question, but that the argument that was presented to the questioner yep. uh, was a loaded argument. Yep. The loaded argument was the uh, Martin Luther question. Yes. How, how was that put again? Uh, my friend brought up issues with Martin Luther removing the extra books, stating Luther also wanted to remove Revelation and James. Yeah, so, so that never happened. <laughs> you know, Martin Luther didn't remove uh, any books, though he did have some questions yeah. uh, about uh, New Testament canon, canonized books. Uh, so, or even theology found in James, I know that. Yeah, so he struggled with the theology in James. Yep. And, uh, uh, you, you know, understandably, you know, James can be a little tricky to understand, especially in light of, say, like Ephesians chapter 2. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, and we could do a whole show just on the difference between James and, and Paul and, and uh, you know, the context of James, which is, you know, a faith that's justified in the eyes of men versus Paul, who was writing about a faith that's justified in the eyes of God. Yeah. So you have to understand the, the difference in context between James and, uh, and Ephesians. Uh, but uh, apart from that, uh, apart from the fact that Martin Luther did struggle with uh, the book of James, uh, and I, and uh, I also remember that he uh, basically referred to the book of Revelation as, as just a, a nightmare, yeah, you know, yeah. someone's nightmare he or something. Nice I, forget, to say about it. I forget the exact quote, but yeah, he wasn't a big fan of the, of the book of Revelation. Uh, but then uh, we wouldn't expect him uh, to be, especially in light of the fact that the Catholic Church really didn't, uh, you know, uh, and still probably doesn't have a, a real good understanding of uh, eschatological events. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think the Catholic Church is still embracing the belief that we're in the millennial uh, kingdom <coughs> currently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that that uh, is, is a position known as a, a mill, uh, which is that we're basically we're in the millennium. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, so with that, uh, you know, I would expect for most Catholics to wrestle with the Book of Revelation. You know, sure. just because eschatology isn't something that the Catholic Church really spends a whole lot of time on. Mm -hmm. uh, so setting aside Martin Luther's issues with James and Revelation, uh, I think he even struggled with Hebrews, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but so regardless of Martin Luther's issues there, uh, what we know uh, is this, that he did not remove any books from uh, the, the biblical canon. Mm -hmm. um, Here's the evidence of that: is that the apocrypha wasn't officially accepted by the Catholic Church until the Council of Trent. Officially accepted. Officially accepted. Yeah. In fact, as you say that, I, I did look it up. The Council of Trent, one of the canons here. So, remember, this was all brought about when Martin Luther brought up the Reformation, 95 Theses, and they went through this whole thing. They had to have a council, and the Council of Trent. They issued one of these canons about, so they list out all the, the books, especially the, uh, the intertestamental books, the mm -hmm. apocryphal right. books. And they say this about the, this entire canon that they list out. If anyone does not accept as sacred and canonical the aforesaid books in their entirety and with all their parts, as they have been accustomed to be read in the Catholic Church, and as they are contained in the old Latin Vulgate edition, and knowingly and deliberately rejects the aforesaid traditions, let him be anathema. Mm -hmm. The same adjective basically used, uh, that Paul used basically, let him be accursed. Yeah, accursed. So you don't have an official acceptance of the Catholic Church of the Apocrypha. Until, Until the Council of Trent. In the year 1500 something, right? Yeah. Yep. So, so why didn't the Catholic Church officially recognize mm -hmm. the books as biblical canon? Not to say that they were excluded. Right. But they weren't officially included either, mm -hmm. you know, as far as the, the church was concerned, as far as an official council statement. Uh, that, that didn't happen until, you know, the 16th century. Yeah. And so, you know, even the, the history, this gets into obviously like how did the books 
that are in the New Testament, how do they come to be? Or even just in general in the Bible, right? Because these apocryphal books are intertestamental books. Right. They're written before the New Testament. Yes. And uh, number one, you have to look at the history of, did the Old Testament Jewish people, did the Israelites, did they accept those as canonical books in the Old Testament? The answer is no. No, they did not. They did not. And another piece of evidence that you find is Josephus. He, he writes out, again, he's, he's, not, he's just a Jewish historian. He's no friend of the Christians or anything. He, and he actually says, he goes out of his way to mention, this is the canon, the list of books that are accepted by these, these, uh, these peop- uh, the, the Jewish people. And the apocryphal books are not mentioned as canonical. Uh, not only that, but you look at the words of Jesus. Jesus was quoting the Old Testament a ton never quoted one of the apocryphal books at all. So there's the, there could be a little bit of argument for silence. That doesn't mean he rejected them, but he didn't go out of his way to quote any of these apocryphal books as well. Going forward in history, it is true that uh, there were some lists of canons that included uh, some of the apocryphal books as part of their canonical lists. But in general, throughout history, you know, even Jerome, when he uh, translated the, the Bible into Latin, that's where they're talking about the Latin Vulgate, even he issued a note and said, you know, I don't, I don't really believe that these are canonical books, but I'm going to basically include them for, for completeness. So even he had his questions about the canonicity of those books. Another piece, strain of evidence that you can look at and say whether these belong in the canon are whether they are reliable themselves. Uh, I believe it is the book of uh, either Maccabees or... or or Tobit, uh, they basically have historical inaccuracies. So they don't, they're not telling, uh, one of them claims that Nebuchadnezzar was, the, was, the, was not the, uh, the king of Babylon, but he was the king of some other, some other region. So there's historical inaccuracies there. Um, also, they, uh, generally speaking, they're introducing new theology that is not in uh, agreement with the general theology of the Old and the New Testament. So there's little bits of ideas about this mention of purgatory that can only be found, I think it's in 2 Maccabees. And that is really where Catholics like to point and say, well, this is where we find purgatory. This idea of purgatory is in the apocryphal literature. But in in general, it actually goes against New Testament theology and Old Testament theology about what happens after you die. So these all these different kinds of evidences are showing that number, it was never really generally accepted but then it, they each individually have their own issues historically um, and, and just talking about accuracy in general and being accepted throughout history. Yeah, and, uh, you know, so, so we see that the Jews didn't accept the apocryphal books as spirit-inspired scripture, uh, and, and so there's no reason for us to either. Yep. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, ultimately this, this is a... Um, you know, kind of an eternal, almost uh, argument between Protestants and Catholics. But I would just want to, you know, whoever is sending the question, just ask your friend. Start asking your friend, do you know the history of the apocryphal literature? You know, was it ever accepted even by the Old Testament uh, Israelites? Never, it never was a part of their canon. And so why should we even consider that? To them, it was, it was, it was given to them the responsibility to take care of God's word. Right? I think that's even mentioned in Scripture. It was to them that was given the responsibility to take care of God's word. And they never included these intertestamental literature. There was no prophet in the intertestamental period. It ended with Malachi. There was no prophet until you know, John the Baptist came. And so you, there is no grounds for accepting any of the apocryphal literature as uh, being part of the, uh, the Old Testament canon. And let me uh, take that out a little bit further. Uh, to an even more solid argument, which is that we never see Jesus referring to the apocryphal works as scripture. Mm-hmm. So if Jesus referred to any of the apocryphal books as being spirit inspired, well, then the church, uh, you know, would, would recognize it. Uh, you know, if Jesus comes along and, uh, and basically presents one of the apocryphal works, First Maccabees, Second Maccabees, Tobit, whatever. Uh, you know, if Jesus comes along and, and appeals to one of those books as being inspired of the Holy Spirit, well, then we would have to agree with Jesus, right? 
Uh, we certainly see him making that argument for the writings of Moses, you know, for the first five books of the Bible, for uh, the Psalms, for, for the prophets. We see him uh, constantly referring to the law and the prophets. Not once does he ever refer to the Apocrypha. Mm. It was around. It's not that Jesus wasn't aware of the Apocrypha, but he never points to the Apocrypha as being spiritually inspired scripture. Only the law and the prophets, which right. we recognize as our current Old Testament. Yep. Yeah, so, true. so there's no there's no New Testament reason for us to think that the Apocrypha belongs uh, in the full canon of, of sacred scripture. Yeah. Not to say that they're not valid books that deserve some attention and historical historical data that at times is valid and and you know and and helpful in some ways, but it's not spirit inspired scripture. Therefore, it doesn't belong uh, in the canon of the Old and New Testament. Mm -hmm. Just because a book is written in in a, in a similar time period doesn't mean it automatically belongs in the Bible. Yeah. That's so you know there's a lot of people who might want to make the case like the Didache the the didactic hmm. writings of the early church fathers, right. right? Should that be part of the canon, that kind of stuff? And I mean, again, you have to go back. What was the church considering as um, authentic and authoritative at that time? And it, right away, the Gospels, Paul's writings, and then just naturally over time, you, you see the canon being accepted. Right. The canon was already formed, but in terms of its acceptance, that took a little bit of time as these writings spread out throughout the region, right? And, you know, just to round it out, not, you know, talking about the Apocrypha, but also the Gnostic Gospels, as you, you were talking, right, this, these later writings after the New Testament. So this kind of argument, just before we just have a couple minutes before we, um, we end our discussion here, but the Da Vinci Code, when the movie came out, and the, the book came out, right, it, there's much talk about what the Council of Nicaea did and what Constantine did right. in order to change the Bible. And there were these missing Gospels that tell the true story of who Jesus was, yeah. his childhood, and, and who he married. Gasp, right? So is there any, any evidence for these that they were removed or they were voted on in the Council of Nicaea to be discarded from the canon? And ultimately, no. Again, this you have to look at when they were written. The vast majority of them were written after the New Testament was already completed, so the second century and on. So these certain Gnostic Gospels that purport to be written by the authors of the New Testament, not a chance. These were written too late. And also the theology found in them. It's Gnostic beliefs. Right. They are heavily contradictory to Jewish belief and the theology found in the New Testament. It does not make sense. And uh, also the Council of Nicaea, whatever claim was being made, by the Da Vinci Code is now, again, I, I hate to pick on Jehovah's Witnesses, but they keep repeating <laughs> You don't this. hate it. Uh, I love it. I, hate, I love it, but I hate Someone it. Someone knocked on your door today, didn't yes. they? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Council of Nicaea did not have anything to do with, you know, forming the canon or anything like that. It had to deal with a discussion about Arianism and, and the, the heresy of Arius talking about Jesus was being a, a created being. And they mentioned, these are the, oh, by the way, these are the books that we we are have been reading but they did not vote on which books to accept and which books to reject so gnostic gospels not a chance that they should be added as well so again guys uh, thank you for joining us that's, that's going to end our discussion today uh thank you for joining us remember uh we're here at calvary south austin austin texas we hope you can join us call our church 512-576-5433 that'll do it i'm reuben this is bungie we're signing off